hear it? <clears throat> we sang a lot of songs this morning that I hope you noticed connected us to our Jewish brothers and sisters. Uh, we were talking a little bit about that this morning, that if you ever question the veracity, the truth of the Bible, look at what the world does with the Jewish people. They don't know what to do with them. And, you know, it's when something outright horrible happens, like happened here recently, uh, you find people trying to come up with a possible reason why it's okay that this happened to Israelis. And you're going, how does this? And then you realize, oh, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. There, there's powers, there's principalities, there's things that make people say bizarre statements, like the Secretary General of the UN saying, it's horrible, he's opposed to the rape, the murder, the terrorist attacks, but it didn't happen in a vacuum. Like, there's some reason for this. And you're, what? And you can get angry and attack, but it's very important to realize you're being reminded of spiritual realities. And something that I like to remind myself, we're going to be looking at Leviticus 3, but the Bible divides the world into two groups of people. Those who bless the children of Abraham and those who curse them. And God blesses those who bless the children of Abraham and he curses those who curse them. And here's the thing. Whatever definition you use for the children of Abraham, if it gets bigger and bigger, what's wrong with that? Just bless more people. But it's very significant for the last 2,000 years, one group of people has persistently claimed to be Israel, the seed of Abraham, and they have borne a terrific stigma for this. They've borne terrific judgment, hatred, and, and the thing that I will never say the Jews are perfect because they're not, they're people. There's good ones, bad ones. And they represent something in the earth that the earth hates. They represent the favor of God. What happened to the first person that God showed his favor to? <laughs> we all know what? His, his brother killed him. Have you ever stopped and looked at the story of Cain and Abel and noticed that Abel didn't do anything to Cain? Nothing. But God showed his favor to Abel's offering, and so Cain kills him. And Paul tells us in Galatians 4 that the son of the slave woman will always persecute the son of the free woman, which in this case was the same woman. And a lot of times as Christians, we've looked at that and said, well, that's the Jews persecuting us. How much persecution have the Jews leveled on Christians for the last 2,000 years? They didn't. That was us, persecuting them. And, and it, a lot of Christians see this. In fact, if you're to find a nation in the world that supports the right for that nation to exist today, it's, it's the U.S. But if you noticed, it's in contest. It's in conflict. There's a fight in our nation. And here's the thing, we are not anti-Palestinian. We are not anti-Arab. I am anti-Hamas, is that okay? And there's a story in scripture. It's a horrible story. Are you all aware there are horrible stories in the Bible? If, if you're not, uh, let me remind you, there are horrible stories in the Bible. There's a story in Judges. How many of you think that Judges is your favorite book? The hard thing about Judges is the way it reveals human character. And I keep hoping that 
We'll tear away the mask and human character will be beautiful. But there's a reason that I need to be born again. But in this story, there's a Levite that went south and he got a wife, concubine, whatever, and he's returning to his home. And the father of the girl keeps telling him, well, stay another night, stay another night. It's true southern hospitality. And he finally has to go, and he goes to the first town, and in this town, the, a fellow takes him in, but it's in the territory of Benjamin. A bunch of men in this town surround the uh, house where this man has taken in the Levite, and they want to attack him. They, and, it's a weird story, you know, if you're a woman's rights person, you'll really love this story. Because he's like, okay, well, you can have my concubine. But they put his concubine out there and they rape her all night. In the morning he goes out and she's dead on the threshold. Did you believe me that it said it was an awful story? Well, the Levite's a bit angry. I'm, I've, it, there's got to be details left out of the story because why is he putting her out there? Anyway, he cuts her in 12 pieces and says a chunk of her to every tribe and says, this can't happen in Israel. This, this is completely vile and obscene. This, this, this cannot happen. And the other Israelites say, no, it can't. And so they all gather around Benjamin and they say, turn over the men who did this horrific crime. Well, what's Benjamin's response? Do you remember? They wouldn't do it. Why? Let me ask you a question. Why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> the Bible tells us how we are, not how we'd like to be. Have you ever had something in you, a thought, a deed, an inclination, a temptation, I don't care what it was, you knew it was rotten, but you didn't want to let go of it. You wanted to keep it. See, this happened to the South. You get all kinds of explanations for why the Civil War occurred. But in the end, the Civil War was about, we brought slavery into our midst. It's necessary for our economy to function. I don't agree with that, but they believed it. And we would rather die than give up this peculiar institution that we've got. They hung on to it so tightly, they fought with the Northern, King Northern Kingdom. That's a good one the northern states for four years. Do you realize that was 100? 1865 was the end of the war, so that's just right out 160 years ago this war was over. And we still have remnants of that battle. And I'm pointing out that what's going on in Israel today is the identical situation in this respect. The Palestinians do not want to let go of the thing that's going to destroy them. Joining themselves to Hamas, joining themselves to the belief from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. What is that? How many Jews are in this little cliche. None. They're going to hang on to this so tightly that they're going to end up like Benjamin. How did it go for Benjamin, by the way? They had three great battles, and the first two battles, Benjamin was victorious. Do you remember that? And the children of Israel, the other 11 tribes, get one of the Lord's, shall we go to battle? And the Lord said, go to battle. And they go, oh. That didn't work out so well. Then the third day, he says, you'll have victory. 
It almost destroyed the tribe of Benjamin. It almost destroyed the South. And it's going to destroy the Arab population of the land of Israel if they don't let go of this need to destroy the seed of Abraham, who they also, they also happen to be. This is very important because you know what we're talking about today in Leviticus 3? A certain kind of offering. What kind of offering would you guess it is? It's a peace offering. We talked about offerings, and one of the things you want to remember is you make an offering to celebrate something that has occurred or that you have already covenanted to do. You don't make a sin offering so you'll repent. You repent and make a sin offering. You make a peace offering because you're celebrating peace. The word for a peace offering is shalem. Zavach shalem. It's, it's an offering of peace. And there are three types. Anybody here remember what the three types of peace offerings are? One is very important, and we just did it. It's Thanksgiving. Then there's the votive, or the offering that surrounds a vow. And then there's one called the free will offering. And if you study this, in fact, I'll, I'll just read it for a minute. Listen as I read the description of the peace offering from the herd and note how much of the flesh goes up to the Lord, the meat. Now if his offering, which is korban, we talked about that, is a sacrifice of peace offerings, he's, if he is going to offer it out of the herd, which just means out of cows, whether male or female, he shall offer it without defect before Yahweh. He shall lay his hand on the head of his offering. Remember we talked about this last time. This is putting weight. You lean on the animal. You push on it. Put your hand on the head of the offering. Slay it at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood around on the altar. From the sacrifice of the peace offerings, he shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. The fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them, which is on the loins and the lobe of the liver, which he shall remove with the kidneys. Then Aaron's son shall offer it up in smoke on the altar on the, burned, of, on the altar on the burnt offering. In other words, the burnt offering is made first thing in the morning, right? So every other offering is laid on it. Which is on the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering by fire of a soothing aroma to Yahweh, to the Lord. Then it describes from the flock, from the sheep, and then from the goat. And they're all exactly the same. What do you burn on? The, it's an offering by fire. What do you burn? Did you listen? Did you notice there was no flesh that was burned? None. Kidneys, lobe of the liver, and fat, internal fat. What happens to the meat from an offering for peace? It's shared, right? The priest has some, the offerer has some, family gets it. The peace offering is a fellowship offering. Anybody with an NIV, you'll notice that's the word they use, is a fellowship offering. It's a shared offering, and it's, and it's interesting because the burned offering, all the meat is burned. None of the meat is saved. It all is burned, and it's an aroma that goes up to the Lord. In fact, Olah, the burnt offering, just means to ascend. But here you have the peace offering, and it's quite different. And it's, it's a Talmudic, if that's a word, tradition that in the, what we would call the millennium, what they call the messianic age, that the only offering that will be made is a peace offering. While you're digesting that, there's three things that are involved in an offering. And, and we've talked a little bit about them, but I want to remind you. The first is the aspect of giving. And I hadn't thought of this, but it, one of the reasons an offering has to be a domestic animal is because it has to belong to someone. A deer, an antelope, it doesn't belong to anybody. You can't, it's, I mean, you can kill the animal and 
process and eat it, that's just fine. You can thank the Lord for it. But because it doesn't come from someone, it can't be an offering. It's that what we talked about last time where David said, if it doesn't cost me anything, I'm not giving it to the Lord. So it, the, altar, the offering has to be given. And that's what we did this morning, thanksgiving. It's an interesting word. It's an English word, but it's also in the, the Hebrew sense of todah, to be thankful. To be thankful is to give something. It, it, it comes from you. It, uh, so thanksgiving is not only a recognition that God has done good things, it's giving him the glory, giving him the honor, thanking him for what he's done. It, it's something you own that you give to him. Another thing, and we all know very well about this one, is the element of substitution. The offering in some way is you. This is the way this particular person puts it. The things that are done to the offering are things that should have been done to the person making the offering, which is a bit brutal. <laughs> but but I, I think we understand that. We, the offering is about substitution. And in fact, without this concept, the cross doesn't make sense. This is one of the reasons the world struggles with the idea of a cross. Why should someone die for my sin? That doesn't make sense. But in the concept of an offering, there is this substitutionary idea. And then the third thing which we mentioned, all these offerings are called korban or kar karbonot, and it just means to draw near. The, the point of the offering is to come near to the Lord. This is true of the burnt offering, it's true of the sin offering, it's true today of the shalem or the peace offerings. We make these offerings to come closer, to draw near. I find it significant, and, and I'm going to take a minute now, because we started off talking about Israel. And I've heard several people say, Jews, that Israel should leave the land. Because as long as they're in the land, there will be contention. They said, we should go somewhere else, and there would be peace. Is that true? But can you see why to the rational mind that seems true? There's one reason why it's not true. Because where is Israel's inheritance? It's in the land. <laughs> and. Our inheritance is contested. You all agree with that? What God's called us to do, where he's called us to be, there's a fight to get it. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. We were talking about that this morning, too, that in the eyes of a lot of people in the world, the Jews of today came into that land and took it away from a group of people that were living there. There's elements of truth in that, but it's mostly false. In 1948, the population of Jerusalem was 50% Jewish. And anybody ever read what Martin Twain had to say about the land of Israel when he visited it? It was barren. There was nothing there. No people living there. What brought people back into the land? The Jews went in there, largely funded, by Rothschild, which us nuts who are conspiracy theorists. Those Jews that came into the land drained the swamps. They planted eucalyptus trees, which took up the water. They turned ground that was unarable, untillable. There was nothing on it. And they started growing crops and vineyards and orchards. And guess what? People started to live there. Now, where there were lots of Arabs living there all the way through this. I totally get that. But the idea 
that the Jews of today just went in and took the land. And, and you can tell how far this goes and how spiritual this dynamic actually is because when you saw what Hamas did, you know, the, the Secretary General, when he said this didn't occur in a vacuum, he actually was telling the truth. But he was thinking of the wrong vacuum. What are Palestinian children taught from the day they're born? They're told the enemy is the Jew, we can never live in peace with the Jew, and the Jew must die. And it's honorable to give our life to kill the Jew. This goes in generation after generation after generation to where people can cut the heads off of babies, they can rape women so violently it breaks their pelvis, they'll take pictures of it and celebrate. Yeah, it didn't happen in a vacuum. And we have people going, there's two sides to everything. No. There's not. In this case, there's righteous and there's unrighteous. This is not about the Palestinian people. Back to the original story about the Benjamites. The best thing that we can do for the Palestinian Arabs is to tell them, get rid of what's in your midst. Remember, Benjamin held on to it. The South held on to slavery. What did it do? I can tell you one another one today. The women's rights movement, which I happen to be firmly behind, most of it. What's going to kill it? Because to be, to give a woman rights, she's got to have the right to kill her baby. And we're going to keep that. What's going to happen? Someday. God in us will wake up and say, killing your baby is not a right for anything or anyone. It will destroy the movement. This is so important because in the world today, you know, people, Christians are out there worrying about the last days, and there are Christians that are waiting for the rapture. If it, we have a rapture, I'll celebrate it, and I hope I'm gone. Actually, I don't. God is preparing to bring his son back to Jerusalem, to reign from Jerusalem. That's what we're getting ready for. What are you talking about all this bad stuff? How many of you know the last 6,000 years of recorded history has had plenty of bad stuff? And waiting for more bad stuff? There's bound to be some. What's happening in the world today, it set, talks about this in Revelation. And it talks about it in several places. Malachi does too. Malachi really hits on this. And he said there's going to be those who fear God and those who do not. Those who are written in the book of remembrance and those who aren't. It's going to be a choice. And I am not... We should not be anti-Arab. God loves the Arabs. In fact, you read the blessing on Ishmael, God bless them. But Ishmael will find his life in blessing Israel. Those who curse Israel will be cursed. This concept of peace that we're talking about. If I were to ask you to define peace, what are some words that you use to define peace? Calm, that's a good one. Harmony. Harmony. So we have a peaceful orchestra? <laughs> we do, don't we? And sometimes jazz gets in there and it takes a while to find peace. <laughs> but seriously, no harmony is good, calm is good, what else? Relax, perfect, purpose. There's a time in history, and I should be careful here because Teresa here, and she knows history, and I don't know it very well. Have you ever heard of Pax Romana? What, what is that? <laughs> there was about a 200-year period in Roman history where the world was at peace, sort of. 
I mean, really, for the average person, it, it, for the average person, it was better. It was prosperous. It was not good for people who were opposed to Rome. They were dead. <laughs> but it started about the, uh, the reign of Augustus, Caesar, about 30 BC, I believe, and went to Marcus Aurelius about 180 years after. So, so it's a little over 200 years. And there was a peace. And, and what, what am I talking about when I talk about peace? Wouldn't you say that one of the definitions of peace has to be an absence of war? An absence of strife? The problem is, is that if you impose peace on a population, do they have peace? I mean, one of the places where there's, of course, I have to be careful now, it's not as true as it used to be, but still kind of true. One of the places where there's the least uh, crime in the world is a prison. And when there is crime, it's immediately, uh, quote, taken care of. But that's not biblical peace. Something that's forced onto you. The Hebrew word shalom, which is where shalem comes from for this peace offering. Shalem and shalom both come from the word shalom, which means, I've got it here someplace. It means to be complete or sound. Purpose fits that. But, so most of us, when we think of peace, we probably don't think of complete or sound or well. You see, in Isaiah 53, it talks about the death of the Messiah will bring shalom. Remember the words, the punishment that brought us what? What's the word? Peace. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. The, the punishment that brought us health, forgiveness, redemption, purpose, calm, all these things was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. That shalom or peace has the element of healing, of completeness. And I don't know about the rest of you. For me, one of the huge things about peace that I love is security. How many of you have a great need for security? I mean, I was thinking about this because when I go to bed at night, when I get up in the morning, I feel secure. I got up this morning and had run out to the dairy for a minute. There's some cows to breed. And I feel safe. I'm surrounded by people that I love and, and I know that would care for me and protect me. Can you imagine having somebody come into your home and kill your children in front of you? See, I, my mind can't process that level of violation is the best word I can think of. And for there to be true peace, no one can be in jeopardy, in fear, vulnerable to that kind of assault. And, and the Bible talks a lot about peace. Uh, shalom, completeness, soundness, welfare. And, and this word that we use for peace offering is alliance, friendship, to be safe, to be completed, to be friendly, to reciprocate. These are, these are all words that we probably don't necessarily associate with peace, but they are connected to this, this biblical concept of peace. And so this, this offering, again, remember, there are three things about the offering. One, it has to cost me something. It, it has to be owned. It's not a wild animal. So it, it has to be owned. It is substitution. An offering in, in some way is a picture of me or you, whoever's making the offering. And the purpose is always to draw close. It's to come near. With the peace offering, it's broken down into three offerings. Thanksgiving, votive or for vows. People would make a vow and they would make an offering. And then it's a free will offering. In other words, you just have the desire to bless. 
Because again, what happens to the meat from a peace offering? It's shared by the priest, the person that brought it, and people that are there. It, the, it is a picture of what in the Greek is called koinonia, fellowship, community. That's what brings us peace. See, I can't have peace, <laughs> maybe you could sort of call it peace, if I go up and live in the hermit's cave. Because I'm just with myself. And I guess there's a level of all those things, but peace biblically, this shalom word and this offering, shalem, have to do with being in peace with each other. And it's interesting to me This conflict in Israel right now is obviously something that's allowing us as human beings and as followers of Yeshua and Aaronites and Levites to make a choice. One of the books that really speaks to Levi and Aaron is the book of Malachi. And everyone knows how Malachi ends. It, it ends talking about I'm sending someone to make a difference. And that person is Elijah. I mentioned this one earlier, but I want to read it. Malachi 3.17. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the days when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. We can't, we can't have peace if we keep the wickedness inside. Like I mentioned with the Benjamites, they would not turn over the men who did this horrible atrocity. There was some sense of loyalty. And I remember Bob Mumford gave a sermon years ago on the difference between faithfulness and loyalty. And the way he defined it, you want to be faithful, not loyal. Because being loyal Benjamin being loyal here almost destroyed the, the tribe, remember? They, they went to war against Israel because they weren't going to surrender these men. Peace is going to come at the price of something. And how many of you know that Yeshua could be confusing? I, I laugh because John Bevere, who is a man I really like, I, <clears throat> I like to listen to him, but he says something that is just absolutely wrong all the time. And he says, God doesn't exaggerate. Yes, he does, John. He does. If your right eye offends you, do what? Gouge it out and cast it from you. Is that what that means? Absolutely not. God does exaggerate. <laughs> he definitely exaggerates to make a point. Yeshua said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God, right? I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. Was that a different person or the same one? I, everybody knows what I'm talking about. Yeshua said that. What's he saying? He's saying, blessed are those who bring wholeness, completeness, wellness to a society. But I came to bring a sword to root out what is evil. See, when you look at Malachi... The righteous will have peace. But there's, it's going to come at the price of a war with the wicked. Now, I don't think in this day we're called to war against flesh and blood. I totally get what Israel is doing. I hope everyone does. I don't know about you, but I couldn't live in a place where I had to worry that someone was going to come in and do the things that have been done. And yet... In the end, does violence ever end violence? It doesn't, does it? What, what is the fruit 
When you plant violence, what's the harvest? It's more violence. You know, we all, we, physically we destroyed Nazism in World War II. Is it gone? Do you realize after these attacks happened, that people went around wearing swastikas and saying, gas the Jews? I mean, really? <laughs> it, it, it wakes me up to the fact that we are in a spiritual battle. And that people, they'll, they'll get into thinking in a way that Isaiah 5 comes to pass. They'll call evil good and good evil and light darkness and darkness light. And it's sincere. They don't know they're doing this. I mentioned Malachi because Malachi ends with Remember the law of my servant Moses. Behold, I am sending you the prophet Elijah. And what will he do? He's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, or what? I'll smite the earth with a curse. So you have this, remember the law of my servant Moses. I'm sending the prophet Elijah. And now, do you remember when God, the Holy Spirit, came upon Zechariah in power after John was born? And they got together to name him, circumcision, all that, celebrate the, I mean, everything was everything wonderful about this. Elizabeth had been barren for years. She and Zechariah finally had a son. They were getting, coming together to celebrate. And Zechariah has been un unable to speak, remember? Because he did not believe the angel that told him he was going to have a son. <laughs> I, I'm always thinking, well, uh, I, I can sort of see why he had a hard time. But anyway, he couldn't speak. Well, when it was time to name the child, he'd obviously communicated to Elizabeth, because Elizabeth said, his name is not going to be Zechariah, his name is going to be John. And they said, well, we better check with the husband, because, you know, Go to Zechariah, what does he do? He writes, his name is John. Boom, his mouth opens. He can talk. I had not noticed, I mean, there's a huge, just one of the most powerful statements in Scripture about the role of John and an Elijah role, a preparation role. But listen to what he says toward the end of this speech in Luke 1. And you, child, this is John, his son, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before, <coughs> excuse me, the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. I don't know why I had never seen this role of the prophet Elijah. Now, we know John came, and we know John prepared the way for Yeshua. How do we know that John is not the all-time fulfillment of Elijah? Have all things been restored? Someone we tend to believe said, Elijah comes and restores all things. Who said that? Yeshua, Jesus. He said, Elijah comes and restores all things. He says, he came and you missed him. He says, he's coming. So John came, but Elijah comes again. I think this still is part of Elijah's ministry. To prepare the way, but to guide people's feet into the way of peace. Did you know we don't know how to live in peace without 
Yeshua without Jesus. I have not, we don't know how to do it. An unregenerate person doesn't get how to live in peace. I wish it weren't that way, but you got examples? I. We need, in fact, I was thinking, you know, so much of the time when we give evangelistic messages, receive the Lord. This is a powerful message and it, and it should happen. It needs to happen. It's vital. But for some reason, we got into this place where we're trying to get people to say, Jesus died for my sins. I'm now his child, which is powerful, is scriptural. But I wonder if maybe in this day God wants to emphasize Yeshua died for my sin. He's my king. He's my king. And I follow my king wherever he goes. Now the kingdom of our God and his Messiah has come. Do you realize that the churches were full of Jesus but we're not full of the king. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? Who said that? And I think, in some way, I, I am not a person that makes predictions because for one thing, I'm wrong enough without adding to it. If you're really concerned about the last days, and I think biblically, I think, hope you all realize the last days started at the time of Yeshua. And we've had 2,000 years of last days. And how long that goes, I don't know. But truly the fulfillment we look for is Elijah turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children to the fathers, guiding our, way in, our feet into the way of peace, and people that actually have Yeshua as king. He's king. And Isaiah 2 and Micah, I think, 4 says the same thing. It has this powerful statement about, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established. It will be chief among the mountains. How many of you know that Jerusalem's not a very tall mountain? I mean, in Israel, it's over 2,000 feet, so it's, for a nation that's average below sea level, it's pretty tall. But what's, what's Isaiah saying? He's not saying this is the, the biggest mountain. It's not bigger than Mount Everest. But he's saying this is going to be the important place in the world. What's going to come from this mountain? Do you remember? The word of the Lord from Zion and the law will come. That kind of sounds like Elijah, doesn't it? But what will happen? They'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. I wish that Israel having a great big victory and squashing Hamas would bring peace on earth. But it won't. Because somebody will be hurt. Have, have you ever noticed that no matter how righteous the cause is, someone gets really hurt in the battle? Violated. I'm sure you're talking about this, but I just keep on having Ephesians 2 go through my mind because he says very clearly that Jesus himself is our peace. Yeah. And he talks about how he destroys the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, and makes those who are far, those who are near, able to come together and, and find peace. No, that's, that's a good one. Kaya mentions Ephesians 2. You remember Ephesians 2 where he talks about Yeshua tearing down the middle wall of partition? What's he talking about? In the temple, when you came up to the temple, there was a Levite at the gate. And what was, he, what was his job? To just, just, just ascertain whether you were an Israelite a Jew or a Gentile, because if you're a Gentile, you are not going in. Now, Yeshua has broken that down. He has become our peace. But you know how I think this happens? Because now you're not a Gentile. It says very plainly in Zechariah that there will be no Gentiles. There will be not a Canaanite. 
in the land. Does that eliminate people? No. That means you're going to choose who's your king. Like you just said, Kaya, he is our peace. And, and you think about it, when you look at the, the controversy in Israel, there are so many things that go into it, but it cannot be solved until there's repentance and forgiveness. And that's hard. I don't know if you ever read that book, Seeking Allah and Finding Jesus. No, I did not. Somebody told me to read it, and I was going to, and I haven't. But, you know, he was from a very uh, well-known Islamic family, as far as descendants go. Like, he was one of the descendants of Muhammad, probably, or whatever. But in his discussion, he brought out this point, which I knew. You know, when you go to Israel and you go to the mosques, on the mosques in, in the er Arabic is written, God is not a father, God has no son. It's written five times on every mosque. God is not a father, he has no son. And, and he was pointing out... That's kind of an obvious God, reason you know, what's going on here. As long as God is merciful, God is whatever, it's all these beautiful things, but one thing they never refer to is God is a father. And... He was talking about how Ishmael... Isn't that interesting in view of Elijah? Go yeah, ahead. How, well, Ish, Ishmael, if you think about it, it was almost like, a, you know, that, that we view our God through the eyes of our father. When, when Ishmael got sent away by his father, it was like a day of saying, he's not my father, I'm not his son. And it was, it was this rejection, he says, it's, it's like carried in deep throughout the whole culture of... God, you don't view God as a father, and you don't view yourself as a son. That's really powerful. You know, it's something I hadn't thought of. Something Christianity often. No, that's really powerful because Ishmael did get separated from his father. And, well, that, you know, when you think about it, uh, in fact, when I, when I look at our civilization, American civilization today, I would say one of the chief causes of the pathology that we see is the lack of fathers. And it's interesting that Elijah, who guides our feet into the way of peace, what does he do? He restores the heart of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. There's a tremendous need to have the father and to know your father. And I'm, I'm grateful that through the Holy Spirit, we come to a place where we see we do have a father. But you know, it, a lot of the reason, of course, that Islam says that is they're reacting to Christianity and Judaism both. Because Judaism and Christianity both teach that God is our Father. And uh, it's, but, but when you look at the, the violence, and we were talking about this this morning, probably most of you know the word Hamas has different meanings depending on whether you're talking about Hebrew or Arabic. See, in Arabic, it means zeal. It means, it's a good word. What does it mean in Hebrew? It's, it's not only violence, it is violence, but it's wholesale profligate violence. In the Bible, when it talks about God sending the flood, that's the reason it was sent, because Hamas filled the world. And, uh, yeah, and it's one of these things I'm careful because <coughs> the people in Hamas believe they are the Arabic definition. But you know what's interesting is they are acting in the Hebrew definition. Indiscriminate violence. I mean, how many of you know that Hamas isn't kind to its own kind? It's a horrible place to be for children, women, that the whole thing. It's just... So... I think it's good to remember, as we bring this to a close today, when you see what's happening today, it is God giving us the chance, like it says in Malachi, to choose what's right. We're not choosing people groups over people groups, except it is powerfully, powerfully important that those of us who believe in our Father God and Yeshua Messiah, that we're the tribe of Levi and Aaron, to, re to realize that that land belongs to the Jews. That's where God wants them. <coughs> and if by his grace and mercy he joins us there, fine. But if we can't see they belong in that land, we cut ourselves off from our inheritance. It is, it, that, in fact, I continue to believe the reason God has continued to bless America is that we have blessed 
the Jews in that land. If we ever turn on them, then you can tell that our sun down has come. But we're, so it, I think that's very, it's important to see that. We do not oppose the Palestinian people. God loves them. I, I think it's very significant that in all these minor prophets, or just the small prophets, where they're talking about the restoration of, of Levi, the restoration of Ephraim and Judah, the restoration of Israel, all of them talking about it, God throws this book of Jonah to remind us that he loves Hamas, the people. How does he do that? Who are the Assyrians? And if you were to look at the Assyrians in terms of God's prophetic timetable, what do they represent to Ephraim? They're the tool of God's judgment. Assyria is the kingdom. It is the empire that banished us and spread us through the whole world. They are the tool that cost us our identity. And yet, God sends a prophet to them and says, repent. And they do. And he spares them. Why is that book in there? To remind us we're not opposing people. God loves people. They carry his image. We do not hate people. But we have to hate the philosophy of Hamas. We have to hate what God hates. And he hates it. Trying to come up with a reason why the attack on Israel was justified is an affront to God's holiness. It's an affront to everything that's moral and righteous and good. And why the world is trying to do this is because of blindness. We want peace, but we can't ever forget that Yeshua said, I didn't come to bring peace, <laughs> I came to bring a sword. And what he was reminding us is there's going to be a separation from sinfulness and wickedness. And if there's anything we want to remember, don't be like the Benjamites and hanging on to what was destroying them. You know, it's a little bit like people that have cancer. And the doctor says, if you'll let me cut that out, you'll get better. You're going to be sick. It's good. You're going to have a bad six months, but then you're going to be better. And saying, nope, I'd just rather be sick. <laughs> you can tell how I feel about that. If something's wrong in there, cut it out. Take it out. Remove it. Be gone with it. Go through the pain of losing what seems so important. Because life is what you want to choose. We're called to choose life. And there's a, there's a great scripture in Romans 14, and I know all of you could, you could say it if I quote, started to quote it. Romans 14, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but what? Tell me the three things. I might forget them too. Righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. What I love is that when we are really walking with the Lord, our peace can go with us into what's chaotic and falling apart. And I have to tell you a joke because it's been a little heavy. It's about the Holy Spirit. And this preacher was doing a revival and he, he had arranged to, at the end of his sermon, he would say, come Holy Spirit. And he had a little boy, I think it was his son, up in the rafters, and he would let a dove go. So as he said, come Holy Spirit, this beautiful white dove would fly down into the congregation. It's very effective. On the third night of the revival, he got to this place and he said, come Holy Spirit, and nothing happened. So come Holy Spirit, nothing happened. Three a little voice. The orange cat ate the Holy Spirit. Should I throw down the cat? <laughs> I'm sorry, but that made me laugh. <laughs> I actually think what we're seeing happen, although my heart breaks for what's going on in Israel, 
Some of the friends I have in Israel, and probably you too, they can't talk. They just cry and cry and cry because of what's happened to little children. I mean, it's just, it's horrible. I know you're all praying for them. And I, and I think it's important to realize you're not praying for somebody out there. You're praying for our brothers, our sisters. You're praying for our family. These are our family. Uh, that's a very real thing. You know, we understand that we're identified with Levi and Aaron, and right now we're a part of Levi and Aaron connected with Ephraim. We are in the church. That doesn't make them any less our family. And a lot of us have been letting them know every way we can. We don't know what will happen, but when we say never again, we mean you're not going down by yourselves. You have people with you. And, and I think of all the things that frighten Jews, it's feeling like it's, they're alone in the world. That's the other thing. You'll see secular Jews in this country. There are secular Jews that in one day went from secular to religious because they went, you know what? There are people that hate me that want to destroy me for one reason only, and that's I'm a Jew. And why do they hate Jews? Because you represent the seed of Abraham. An interesting thing, and I'm supposed to end here. You know in the Bible, it talks about Joseph when he's having all his trials. And yet it keeps saying this thing you can't figure out. And the Lord was with him. <laughs> and he gets thrown into a pit, taken to Egypt as a slave, and it keeps saying the Lord was with him. And then Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him, he refuses, and out of his righteousness, into jail, and it keeps saying the Lord is with him. And the Lord showed me that we look at the Jews, and they've been through, they lost a third to half of the population through the Crusades. Two-thirds of Europe's Jews died in the Holocaust. And you know, you know why we're so mad? Is that Jews are so successful. Everything they touch succeeds. They weren't allowed to farm for a thousand years. They go to the land of Israel, their cows give the most milk, their crops produce the highest. God is with them and that makes us angry, not us. And the world says it's a conspiracy. It is, I figured it out, it is a conspiracy. God is with them. <laughs> and he is with us. And, and this is a good time. The things we're seeing is God getting ready to bring his kingdom to earth. Let's celebrate the coming kingdom. There's, there's enough bad stuff, we don't need to anticipate it. Let's all stand. Kaya, would you close for us, please? Father in heaven, I, I thank you for your peace that you've given us. That, that Father, that uh, when Abraham was willing to give what he had, that you willingly gave what you had. And on that mountain we see that you, you gave your son. Amen. And Father, I, I pray that even as John was saying, that we see that God is with Israel, that God is with us, that, that we would remember Emmanuel, that we would know what it means to mm -hmm. say God with us, that we would open our eyes that it isn't just violence, that ever will answer anything, but it is going to be understanding who our peace is. And Lord, we pray for Israel, we pray for all the sons of Abraham, and for all those who will become sons of Abraham. Father, that this would be a day when eyes are open and hearts are open to receive their king. So Lord, we thank you for your word, we thank you that your, your law does go forth from Mount Zion. And Lord, we desire to be reconciled today to what you're saying, to what you're doing. And we say this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so I guess, Ron, you want people back here at quarter after?